Good evening, one and all. Thank you for taking the time off from your very busy schedules to be with us here at the National University of Singapore for the second lecture in our lecture series of um, the practice of uh, foreign affairs uh, to be delivered by Mr. Bilal Hari Kausikan. Uh, my name is Associate Professor Terence Lee. I'm the Deputy Head of Department of the Department of Political Science. So it gives me a warm, ple uh, it gives me a lot of pleasure to welcome you here. So without further ado, uh, let me just um, invite Mr. Bilahari onto the podium here, onto the lectern here rather, um, to deliver his remarks on uh, Malaysia and Indonesia. Can you all hear me? Is the mic working? Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Some of you who went for the first lecture must be devil for punishment or a uh, natural masochist to come back. I am not referring to the students because I, I gather you have no choice but to come back. <laughs> but the rest of you. Anyway, thanks for making time this evening. Uh, this lecture is going to be a little longer than the first one, so let me get straight to it. My uh, first lecture had dealt with some basic concepts. And in particular, I introduced the idea of the core national interests, which for Singapore I identified as a multiracial meritocracy. Uh, this core interest provides a sense of direction amidst the maneuvers every country needs to take to adapt to unpredictable international developments. And for small countries whose so ability to shape such developments is limited, more than other kinds of countries, they need, we need a clear bearing. I had further argued in the last lecture that the definition of the core interest in any country is always the result of a political process. In our case, it arose from the political contest of the 1950s and early 1960s that inextricably intertwined the struggle between the left and the right within the communist-backed united front with the struggle against Chinese and Malay chauvinists in the broader context of global processes of decolonization and the Cold War. Now, these tangled events led to merger with Malaysia, but after a few, days, few years, made it impossible for us to remain part of Malaysia. And those experiences shaped our subsequent independent political history. I do not propose to recount those tumultuous events in detail. There are any number of excellent works that do so, and I refer the curious to them. If you like, see me afterwards and I'll give you a list. It's enough to say for this evening that the struggles converge in a fundamental disagreement over a point of political values. In the terminology of the day, was it to be a Malaysian Malaysia or a Malay Malaysia? But to fully grasp the significance of that distinction, we need to take a step back from the events of 1963 to 1965. Speaking in the Singapore Legislative Assembly on 5th March 1957, Mr. Lee Kuan Yew said, and I quote, in the context of the second half of the 20th century, island nations are a political joke. Now, to understand the foundations of Singapore's foreign policy, this is, is, this is as good a place to start as any. Mr. Lee was speaking during a debate on the eve of the second round of constitutional talks due to be held in London. The first round had ended in failure largely because the then Chief Minister, Mr. David Marshall, had asked for too much, full independence, which the British were unwilling to grant. This particular legislative assembly debate sought formal endorsement for the position to be taken by the all-party delegation to the second round of constitutional talks. And the goal this time was more limited, internal self-government, with defence and foreign affairs to be left in the hands of the British. Now, in describing island nations as a political joke, Mr. Lee was making the case for internal self-government as a step towards eventual merger with Malaya. And now, this was not a goal shared by everybody in that delegation, uh, or even in his own party. 
But Mr. Lee's statement was not mere political rhetoric calculated only to have an effect in a particular context. There is ample evidence to demonstrate that he and his colleagues believed that an independent Singapore could not survive without merger. And as a historical fact, most small countries have not survived for very long as sovereign states. The Venetian Republic, which existed for over a millennium, stands out as an exception and holds lessons for Singapore. Lessons both in its longevity and in its long decline, uh, which I will take up in my last lecture. Most of the city-states in Renaissance Italy had far shorter lives. Today, most members of the United States nations are small by one criteria or another. Most are relatively recent creations. Many, perhaps most, have had their sovereignty seriously compromised in one way or the other, and only a few can be really accurately described as economic successes. Uh, as I argued in my first lecture, this is because small countries have no intrinsic relevance in the international system, any international system. Small city-states with no hinterland within their sovereign territory have even less intrinsic relevance than most other types of small countries. Irrespective of whether you date Singapore's history back 700 years or 200 years from 1819 or just the 54 years or coming 54 years since separation from Malaya, Malaysia, Singapore has performed no function that requires us to be sovereign. We have performed much the same functions as Temasek, as a British colony under Japanese occupation and as a state within Malaysia. Sir Frank Swettingham, former governor of the Straits Settlements and High Commissioner for the Federated States, once described Singapore as the, and I quote, as the Clapham Junction of the Eastern Seas. He was keeping off the British period, of course, but the metaphor has a longer temporal applicability. We were Clapham Junction even before there was a Clapham Junction in Britain. And we express much the same idea when we today speak of Singapore as a hub or a node or a centre. We are rather fond of describing ourselves that way. It's not new. Singapore's political development can be understood only if Mr Lee's 1957 statement is read alongside subsequent statements by him and other first-generation leaders. In the early 1980s, speaking to Dennis Bloodworth, a veteran British journalist, about the PAP's struggles in the communist-supported United Front, Mr. Lee said, and I quote, some mug had to do it. Dr. Ko King Si echoed the sentiment. He said, I quote, it was an act of reckless folly. We were five foolish young men and we walked right into it. Mr. Lee's 1957 statement was de deterministic in tone. The implication was that small countries, precisely because they are small, cannot survive in the latter 20th century international system. And to attempt to be independent was therefore a political joke. The subsequent statements by Mr. Lee and Dr. Goh, quoted by Dennis Bloodworth, stressed agency and choice, albeit cloaked in self-deprecating irony. As the first lecture pointed out, although small countries are largely price takers in the international system, small countries are nevertheless never entirely without agency. Exercising agency requires the wit to see opportunities, the judgment to weigh the risks, and the courage, having done so, to act within the margins of possibility. And this is the point of the self-deprecating statements by Mr. Lee and Dr. Goh that I have just quoted. Our leaders believed that small as we were, they had agency. Were it not so, island countries would indeed be a political joke, and Singapore as we know it today would not exist. As Mr. Lee, again quoted by Bloodworth, explained, and I quote, We wanted the British out. We believed nationalism to be a more potent force than communism, we pressed on regardless of the horrendous risks. 
Well, pressing Ron requires great agility, but also a clear sense of direction, and hence of the national interest, and in particular of the core national interest. The definitive statement of Singapore's national interest was made by our first foreign minister, Mr. S. Rajaratnam, in his first major statement on Singapore's foreign policy to Parliament on the 16th and 17th of December 1965. His statement deserves to be better known. Almost every statement by subsequent foreign ministers on our foreign policy is only an elaboration of or commentary on it. I will be referring to that speech several times in the course of this series of lectures. Mr. Rajaram's statement dealt with several aspects of Singapore's national interests. But Mr. Rajaram st stressed, and I quote, Our ultimate goal is the preservation of the essential values on which our society is founded. Essential values. Those essential values are defined by multiracial meritocracy, which is how, since 1965, we have described the idea once expressed as a Malaysian Malaysia. Now, multiracial meritocracy is a portmanteau term encompassing a cluster of more or less consistent assumptions, more or less consistent values, and more or less consistent policies. I say more or less because perfect consistency is impossible on earth. Our meritocracy is not perfect, there is no perfection except in heaven, but we take the idea very seriously, perhaps more seriously than younger Singaporeans who have known no other reality and have had the term so often as to take it for granted may understand. The greatest miscalculation our first genera generation leaders made was perhaps to have underestimated how viscerally Malay leaders across the causeway held the idea of Malay dominance. It was not a mistake we should ever make again. Having risked an unexpectedly independent Singapore becoming a political joke over a point of principle, we had, we had to make the principle work. And it set the course for our future development. Multiracial meritocracy is not just a pragmatic arrangement. It is a normative value. It is how we believe our society ought to be organized. It defines the essential values, the preservation of which Mr. Rajarandam described as the ultimate goal of our foreign policy. As I have stressed several times in my first lecture and earlier in this lecture, small city-states have no intrinsic relevance to the international system. How do we maintain relevance? How do we create and maintain relevance? There is no magic formula. What makes you relevant in one situation or issue may be irrelevant in another situation or issue, and in any case changes over time. But maintaining relevance is not just a matter of agile and pragmatic adaptation. That is a necessary but insufficient condition. More crucially, implicit in Mr. Rajaram's statement I just referred to, is that fundamentally, maintaining relevance means preserving our uniqueness, preserving the essential values which are our unique value proposition. They are what makes Singapore, Singapore. In my first lecture, I told you that no other country from Northeast Asia to Southeast and South Asia to the Middle East organizes themselves in the same way as we do. Without exception, without exception, Formal or informal ethnic, religious, or other kinds of hierarchies enforced to different degrees are the norm in that huge swathe of territory. Before I go on to discuss the implications of this fact in the specific cases of Malaysia and Indonesia, a few examples of other countries may be a useful reminder of the context in which Singapore exists. Indonesia's formal organizing principle is Pancasila which is like multiracial meritocracy, a horizontal concept. In practice, however, it is a hierarchy of pribumi over non-pribumi and the Javanese over other re regions, while Islam is, increase, is being increasingly stressed over Pancasila. In Thailand, the hierarchy is of ethnic Thai Buddhists over southern Malay Muslims and of the Bangkok elite over the northeast, for example. In Myanmar, it is Burma Buddhists over other ethnic groups and religions, the Muslim Rohingya being the most prominent and egregious example. 
In Vietnam and Laos, both Lenin estates, it is ethnic Vietnamese and ethnic Lao over other ethnicities and members of the Communist Party over other organizations. In the Philippines, it is Catholics over Southern Muslims and Luzon oligarchs over other regional oligarchies. Japan is a liberal democracy, but the deep structure of Japanese society is defined by a hierarchy in which the ethnic Japanese stand over Japanese citizens of Korean or other ethnicities. And it was only a few weeks ago, this year, 2019, that a bill was introduced in the Diet that recognizes the Ainu as the indigenous people, as an indigenous people in Japan. What they were before, I cannot imagine. How they were thought of before, I cannot imagine. China formally recognizes 56 nationalities, and the Chinese Communist Party is a meritocracy of sorts. In practice, it is a hierarchy of Han over non-Han, as can be seen from recent attempts to forcibly sinicize the Muslim Uyghur. In India, a hierarchy of Hindus over Muslims is being increasingly asserted. In Pakistan, it is Sunni Muslims over other variants of Islam and other religions. In Sri Lanka, it is the Sinhalese over the Tamils and Buddhists over other religions. Brunei and much of the Gulf are absolute monarchies which are hierarchies by definition, hierarchies of family, in which Sunni Islam stands at the apex, as it does in many other Arab states, except Iraq, Lebanon and Syria, where Shia Islam or Alawites occupy the apex. In Iran, it is Persian over other ethnicities and Shia Islam over the Sunnis and other religions. In Turkey, Erdogan's definition of modernist Islam and a Turkish identity is being asserted over other variants of modernizing Islam and the Kurds. Significant groups in liberal democratic Israel are trying to assert an orthodox Jewish or an uncompromising Zionist identity over secular Jews and Arab Israeli citizens. Or citizen, Arab citizen, Arab, Israeli citizens or Arab descent. Now, I tell you all this, firstly, to depress you, uh, but more fundamentally to stress again how unique Singapore is. How, in a way, unnatural we are in this territory. And there are other regional or sub-regional hierarchies, which I, I don't want to depress you too much. But I think our uniqueness is adequately demonstrated. So let me return to our immediate neighbourhood, Malaysia, Indonesia. The principle of a Malaysian Malaysia and its subsequent manifestation after 1965 in the norm of multiracial meritocracy was an explicit rejection by a small ethnic Chinese majority city-state situated in the midst of the Malay world of the politically subordinate position enshrined in Article 153 of the Malaysian Constitution which uh, provides for the special position of the Malays, which is a polite euphemism for Katuanan Malayu or Malay dominance. Anyway, as an explicit rejection of the politically subordinate position, which non-Malay Malaysian citizens had accepted, or to which they had, particularly after the May 1969 racial riots, resigned themselves. Even though Singapore is now a separate sovereign state, this is not a situation that Malaysia is entirely comfortable with. For similar but not exactly the same reasons, that is also the situation with Indonesia. Both project on us too much of their attitudes towards their own Chinese minorities. After separation, the Malaysians had three instruments that they thought would bring us crawling back on their terms or at least bring us bring independent Singapore tamely to heel. First, the military. In 1965, Singapore did not have any armed force worth the name. Article 5.3 of the Separation Agreement, I bet many of you younger ones don't know this, Article 5.3 of the Separation Agreement provides for Malaysian armed forces to be stationed in Singapore. That article and that agreement is still in force. It's lodged in the UN. And they did station their armed forces in Singapore. The second instrument was water. We were then almost entirely dependent on Malaysia for water. Third, the economy. Modern Singapore was founded as the entrepôt for Malaysia and Indonesia, and they meant to displace us from that role. 
Now, these were all very serious challenges, and it was not to be taken for granted that we could overcome them. In a book published in 1972, a British academic predicted, and I quote, the future of the city-state of Singapore will be largely determined by events in the surrounding countryside of the Malay world, and the Republic can do little more than wait. He went on to conclude, and I quote again, the lines of domestic conflict have been drawn. Singapore's tragedy is not merely that insurrection, he meant domestic insurrection, huh? insurrection will occur in the near future, but that if and when it does occur, it will threaten the very survival of Singapore in Southeast Asia. Well, needless to say, domestic insurrection did not occur in Singapore, nor did we do little more than wait for others to decide our fate. With crucial assistance from Israel, no other country offered significant help. The SCF became a credible deterrent, recognized as the strongest and most technologically advanced armed force in Southeast Asia. After we revealed in the 1969 National Day Parade that we had armour, something the Malaysians did not have at that time, after we revealed that we had armour, the Malaysians began to withdraw their ground forces from our territory, although a few remnants of their navy lingered on until 1997 when they left for what they said was economic reasons. Water is life. As the farmer, former chief of the Malaysian Armed Forces, Freddy Hashim, General Freddy Hashim, publicly revealed in 1994, it was made absolutely clear to him that any attempt to interfere with our water supply would result in the SAF moving in. So, they never tempered with the water supply. Water self-sufficiency is now within our reach. Today, despite Malaysia's own abundant water resources, we supply more portable water to Malaysia than we are obliged to under the terms of the water agreements. And when water is short in Malaysia, as it periodically is, they ask us for even more. What about the economy? Singapore is now economically interdependent with and not dependent on our neighbours. To paraphrase a 1997 speech by Mr. Rajaranam, despite the best efforts of our neighbours to displace our regional role, independent Singapore did not collapse because, and I quote, we now draw sustenance not only from the region but also from the international economic system, system which as a global city we belong, end of quote. And this was the, this was the consequence of deliberate policy choices, which ran counter to the then prevailing economic wisdom. The point is, none of this, none of this happened by accident. The story of Singapore since 1965 is a story of how the government and people exercise agency within the constraints faced by a small city-state in a not friendly neighbourhood to overcome these serious, indeed existential challenges in ways that the British academic I just quote, third, entirely failed to foresee 40 years ago. He was not wrong in describing the seriousness of the challenges. In his memoirs, Mr. Lee himself recalled, the pressures falling separation were relentless. But for all his knowledge of, de of details, that British academic did not understand the most important thing about Singapore and thus came to wrong conclusions. And what that British academic did not understand and many foreigners and even Singaporeans to this day still insufficiently understand is how seriously we took the essential values that Mr. Rajaranam spoke of. It was nevertheless on occasion a close-run thing. In an essay to commemorate, commemorate Mr. Lee Kuan Yew's 90th birthday, Janas Devan, who incidentally is the son of uh, Devan Nair, uh, a former president and a first-generation PAP leader, Janas Devan wrote, and I quote, there was a good deal of trial and error. The fact that the first generation leaders did not commit a large number of crippling errors does not mean that there wasn't plenty of trial. Janadas concluded that in Singapore's formative years, our leaders made the right choices because, and I quote him again, they and the people they led were animated by a set of values that made possible correct political, economic and social choices. 
leadership, for there is nothing automatic about translating values into viable state institutions, consisted of insisting on the primacy of those values and refusing to compromise on them. Could we have succeeded if we behave as Malaysia and Indonesia preferred, meekly accepting a subordinate position and behaving like a small state, surviving cap in hand by the leave and favour of our larger neighbours? I doubt it. Today, the governments of our neighbours deal with Singapore as a sovereign equal only because we have developed capabilities that have given them no other choice. It is not their preferred way of dealing with a small ethnic Chinese majority city-state. They would prefer us to accept a subaltern role, as do their own Chinese populations, or show the deference they think an Ade, that's us, Ade means a younger sibling, they ought to display towards the Abang, the elder brother. That's them, in their own minds at least. The dynamic of bilateral relations with our neighbours is driven by the difference between the norm of multiracial meritocracy, by which we have chosen to organise ourselves, and the very different principles, explicit or implicit, by which Malaysia and Indonesia have chosen to organise themselves. The basic issue is not what we do or do not do on any specific matter, water, airspace or maritime boundaries. These old issues and any others that may arise in the future are only proximate causes. The basic and enduring issue is not what we do but what we are, a multiracial meritocratic small city state that performs better than they do and we must always perform better. The very, existence, the very existence of a diametrically different system, too close to be ignored or disregarded, that does better than their systems, poses an implicit criticism of their systems to their own people. And that's why Malaysian Malay polit politicians react neuralgically when Singapore releases statistical data that demonstrates that Singapore Malays have generally done better than Malaysian Malays. Uh, the last time we did this was 2001. Mr. Go Chok Tong was then Prime Minister. We don't do this very lightly, or when we don't do this very often. But on occasion, they need to be reminded that we have domestic politics too, that is not costless for them to disregard. Now, time and our ability to overcome the challenges they have thrown at us has blunted the harsher edges of their attitudes. But as it is highly unlikely that either Malaysia or Indonesia will change their organising principles, the essential dynamic and hence the imperative, their imperative, of periodically trying to put us down or at least periodically testing the boundaries of the relationship will never entirely go away. The dynamic may operate at different tempos or with different degrees of intensity under different circumstances but it is difficult to conceive of that dynamic being substantially modified in the foreseeable future. Now, the problems that arise with Malaysia are sometimes described as a historical baggage. That is a profoundly misleading metaphor. It is, of course, a historical fact that the two systems once shared the brief but traumatic experience of being one state, and this often makes differences of interest more emotionally fraught than differences between sovereign states ought to be. But the term baggage connotes something disposable. If your suitcase gets old, throw it out and buy a new one. If it's too heavy, lighten it. But history cannot be disregarded, discarded. It can only be reinterpreted. And no serious reinterpretation can ignore basic facts, and the most important of which being the fundamental reason, reason merger with Malaysia could not succeed. Incompatibility of political principle and consequently the very different trajectories we have taken since 1965. Now after Barisan National, that's the coalition that in one iteration or the another had ruled Malaya and then Malaysia since independence in 1958. 57. Well, Barisan National lost the 2018 general election and was replaced by a new coalition, Pakatan Harapan. All bilateral issues 
almost immediately resurfaced. Why? It would be wrong to place too much emphasis on the personality of the new old PM, Dr. Mahathir, although that was undoubtedly a factor. More fundamentally, what happened at the Malaysian general election last year, more fundamentally, was not, as some Singaporeans seem to believe, and many Malaysians somewhat naively hoped, a change of system. It was only a change of government. Demographics makes it highly improbable that the system will change. The latest Malaysian census, which I just released a week or two ago, the latest Malaysian census showed that the Chinese were down to 23.4% of the population, with the Bumiputra at 68.6%, the Indians at 7%, and others at 1%. The official projection is that by 2040, the Bumiputra will be 72.1%, with all other ethnic groups collectively at less than 30% and the Chinese are projected to show the largest decrease of minus 4.5% by 2040. Well, the obvious political consequence is that Malaysian politics, already dominated by Malay Islamic politics, will steadily become even more insistently Malay is Islamic politics. Bumi Putra privileges are certainly not going to be reduced in any significant way, as the new Pakatan Harapan government has already made clear. Furthermore, the new Pakatan Harapan government, by the way, Harapan means hope, so I think they need a lot of hope. <laughs> Furthermore, the new Pakatan Harapan government is fundamentally incoherent. Cracks began to show almost immediately after Pakatan Harapan formed the new government, with some Malay members of the coalition taking issue with a Chinese being appointed finance minister and an Indian being appointed attorney general. Since then, tensions between more or, uh, more or less, more, more Malay nationalists and less Malay nationalists, factions have appeared within Anwar Ibrahim's Partai Keadilan Raya, PKR. And tensions have appeared between PKR and Dr. Mahathir's Partai, Parti Pribumi Bersatu Malaysia. That party calls itself Bersatu, which means unity for short but its emphasis is clearly on Pribumi, which means indigenous people. It is not to be taken for granted that Anwar Ibrahim will replace Dr. Mahathir as the next Prime Minister of Malaysia. The good doctor and Anwar came together only to defeat Najib and the Barisan National. Despite what they may say, there is no trust between them and no reason for them to trust each other now that Barisan National has been defeated. PKR or Kadilan and Bersatu simultaneously compete with each other and compete with AMNO and PAS for Malay support. Bersatu has today attracted seven defections from AMNO MPs and more are expected, especially from Sabah, where AMNO has practically disintegrated. This has caused some disquiet in other members of Pakatan Harapan. Estimates of the overall breakdown of Malay votes in the 2018 general election vary. The variation is itself an indication of the sensitivity of that statistic. One of the more generally reliable estimates is that by Merdeka Centre, which gave Pakata Harapan 25-30% to 30 of the Malay vote, with Barisan National, really meaning AMNO, getting 35-40% to 40 of the Malay vote, and pass 30 to 30% 30 of the Malay vote. Now, in other words, even if you give Pakatan Harapan the upper range, uh, 30%, and AMNO and pass the lower range, that is to say 35 and 30%, the opposition Malay parties, and AMNO and pass are now in a de facto political alliance, got more than double the Malay votes than the ruling Pakatan Harapan coalition. And this is not a stable situation. Using Singapore as a bogeyman or whipping boy to rally the Malay ground is a time-tested tactic. Dr. Mahathir used it when he led AMNO. He uses it now that he is head of Bersatu. That this is not just a matter of personality or historical baggage, but the structural consequence 
of the dynamic between two types of political systems was demonstrated after the dispute over Malaysian port limits intruding into Singapore territorial waters surfaced. Rais Hussein, a member of Basatu Supreme Council, threatened Singapore with, and I quote, pain by a thousand cuts if we were not more accommodating. Now, why am I telling you this? Mr. Hussein is 52 years old. He can have no personal experience of the traumatic events leading to se separation. He wasn't even born. So what historical baggage can he have? It is a conditioned response, conditioned by the nature of his political system and the imperatives it, it generates. Now let me go to Indonesia. Singapore was never part of Indonesia within living memory. In fact, there was no Indonesia before the Dutch. In principle, if not in practice, Indonesia's state philosophy of Pancasila is less incompatible with multiracial meritocracy than Malaysia's Ketuanan Melayu. These factors make Singapore-Indonesia relations relatively less fraught than Singapore-Malaysia relations. Now, relatively less fraught. Relatively less fraught does not mean uncomplicated. Relations with Indonesia are not free of the expectation of deference that an elder brother feels entitled to expect of a younger sibling. The operative word here is entitled. A different version of the same essentially racially driven dynamic that complicates Malaysia-Singapore relations also operates with Indonesia. Many, perhaps most pre-Bumi Indonesians, see majority Chinese Singapore as a chukong, a chukong well, can be translated comprador, a chukong writ large. Uh, if some Chinese Indonesians have grown rich, it is only because the pre-Bumi, in their kindness and generosity, have allowed them to prosper. Therefore, they feel entitled to draw upon the wealth of Chinese chukongs and Singapore in the case of need as became evident during the Asian financial crisis of 1997. The sense of entitlement is not just economic. Writing in 1964, while Confrontasi, the undeclared war that Indonesia waged against Malaysia and Singapore from 1963 to 1966, was still ongoing, the late George Cahin, one of the most thoughtful analysts of Indonesia, located the essential cause of Indonesian aggression in, and I quote, the powerful, self-righteous trust of Indonesian nationalism, end quote, and the widespread belief, and I quote him again, because of their country's size, it has a moral right to leadership, end quote. Now, it's highly unlikely that that combustible confluence of personality, Sukarno, domestic and international politics that led to confrontasi will again result in naked military aggression. The international ethos is today no longer that of the 1960s, and living dangerously, to use Sukarno's 1964 phrase, is not an attractive option now that Indonesia has more to lose. Entitlement and self-righteousness are different sides of one coin. Time and economic development has given a more sophisticated gloss to these attitudes. But have they really changed? This is less certain. How else to explain Vice President Yusuf Kala's outrageous statements in 2013 that Singaporeans should not complain about a few months of haze but instead be grateful for the oxygen Indonesia provides during the rest of the year? How else to explain Indonesia's insistence that others be sensitive to their concerns without any expectation of reciprocity. And other examples will come readily to mind of even a casual observer in Indonesia. Now, what are the sources of Indonesian entitlement and self-righteousness? Size is, of course, an important factor, as George Cahin pointed out. But there is also a more profound cause. Indonesia is not just a geographic place name. More fundamentally, Indonesia is an idea. Indonesian nationalism inherited the spatial or geographic idea of Indonesia from the Dutch. 
But to the Netherlands, Indonesia was only a colony, a mere source of income. Nationalism demanded a more positive and ambitious idea of Indonesia. What was that ambitious, positive idea to be? It could not be based on size alone, although Indo Na Indonesian nationalists insisted that the borders of the Dutch creation should also be the borders of a sovereign Indonesia and shed blood for it. But beyond that, there was, no, there was little agreement. Since independence, the idea of Indonesia has been contested and the contests have not yet entirely ended. There were two main lines of contention. First was this sprawling almogram of ethnicities and cultures, this archipelago of um, more than 17,000 islands going to be a Java-centric unitary state or some looser configuration. Second and more crucially, was this to be an Islamic idea of Indonesia or a secular idea of Indonesia? The first two presidents, Sukarno and Suharto suppressed debate over these issues and imposed a secular unitary state by force. But both issues simmered under the service to break into the open after Suharto fell from power and his new order was replaced by an ill-disciplined democracy. There was a moment when post-Suharto Indonesia looked as if it might disintegrate, particularly after Suharto's successor, President Habibi, he of the little red dot fame, almost impulsively, or at least with no real preparation, cut East Timor loose from Indonesia. Fortunately, the worst did not occur. Susilo Bambang Yudihono, the fourth post-Suharto president, reached an accommodation with Aceh that kept it within a unitary Indonesia. Today, only a minor successionist rebellion persists in Papua, but with no real prospect of success. But this is not the end of the story, nor is it necessarily the most significant part of the story. Habibi passed new laws that promised wide autonomy to the regions. His successor, Abdul Rahman Wahid, uh, also known as Guzda, or maybe better known as Guzda, adopted regulations to give effect to the new laws. The laws and regulations came into force in January 2001. Both law and regulation seem to be more the result of democratic enthusiasm than systematic thought. Since 2001, Indonesia is a unitary state in form, but one in which the authority of and lines of command between different, detail, different levels of administration remain unclear and therefore contested. The 1945 Jakarta Charter, minus a crucial phrase that would have made Sharia obligatory for Indonesian Muslims, remains in the preamble of the Indonesian Constitution. The very first principle of Pancasila, belief in, and I quote, the one and only God, was itself an ambiguous compromise which, with advocates of the Islamic idea of Indonesia. Ambiguity has kept that idea alive. In one guise or another, there have been periodic attempts to resurrect the Jakarta Charter in its original form. The administrative incoherence of post Suharto Indonesia has allowed pockets of Sharia to emerge and take root at the local level. Now, I doubt, I doubt that Indonesia will ever explicitly become an, an Islamic state. Uh, incoherence creates its own checks and balances. Uh, still, Islam has emerged as a potent and legitimate political force in post Suharto Indonesian politics. Islamic parties have not succeeded in capturing power, but the genie is out of the bottle. And no Indonesian politician can today ignore Islam's mobilizing energy. Every political party has had, in some degree, to adopt the symbols and trappings of Islam irrespective of political platform. Indonesia is today a semi-Islamic state. A complication is a phenomenon that can be termed the Arabization of Islam. More exclusive Salafist or Wahhabist variants of Islam from the Middle East have steadily replaced the traditionally syncretic and open variants of Southeast Asian Islam. <clears throat> 
It's too simple to attribute this to only Saudi Arabia or other Gulf states funding mosques and madrasas. That is undoubtedly a factor, but in principle, I'm not saying it's easy, but in principle, external funding can be stopped. More fundamentally and more crucially, I think, since the language of the Quran is Arabic, and since only a minuscule number of South East Asian Muslims understand Arabic, almost anything from the Arab world has an automatic and uncritical authenticity facilitated by the internet. It's not so easy to stop. It's a form of an inferiority complex. I, sometimes when I give lectures like this, when I see a, a Muslim woman covering her head, I conduct a little experiment. I pretend not to know the word and ask her what that is called. I want to see whether she says hijab, which is an Arab word, or tudong, which is a Malay word. And normally, if they say hijab, I say, why do you use an Arab word when you, there is a good, perfectly good Malay word? And they usually don't have any answer. I'm not going to conduct the experiment today, since I've already revealed it. Also, you may, some of you may have noticed in the last Hari Raya, I saw many greeting cards, even posters, saying Eid Mubarak, which is an Arabic phrase. Why not say Selamat Hari Raya? It's even worse in Malaysia, by the way. Huh? Okay. Anyway, that's a bit of a digression. I doubt that the Arabization of Islam in Southeast Asia can be reversed unless the Middle East changes in ways that are highly improbable. Now, as the manner in which Southeast Asian Muslims conceive of and practice their religion changes, so also does the texture of Muslim communities and their relationships with other communities change. As the texture of Muslim communities evolves, so also does politics. As politics changes, the political cost of managing Islam in plural societies rises. Few, if any, Malaysian or Indonesian politicians have displayed the courage to resist the trend by deploying state power against extremists. Actually, Dr. Mahathir is one of the few exceptions in his previous uh, iteration as Prime Minister. But he too is not without responsibility. In September 2001, Dr. Mahathir, then leader of AMNO, challenged PASS by declaring that Malaysia was already an Islamic state. Uh, this sparked a minor constitutional crisis because the constitution says something somewhat different. But the more profound consequence of Dr. Mahathir's statement was to legitimize a political dynamic in which those inclined to religious moderation were almost bound to be disadvantaged, bound to lose. You can outbid you. All this can be outbid. You say, all right, we are Islamic State. I want to do this, to define an Islamic State. And then you have to do something else. And then they will do something else. The moderates are bound to lose. Mahathir's subsequent attempts to walk back his 2001 statement entangled him in conceptual and political contradictions from which the DAP, now his partner, now conveniently avert their eyes. They pretend not to see. In December 2016, President Jokowi in Indonesia attended Islamist organized street demonstrations against his one-time political partner, then Jakarta Governor Basuki Ahok Purnama. He's a Chinese Indonesian and a Christian. Jokowi's intention was to defuse a potentially explosive situation. But he had much the same effect as Dr. Mahathir's 2001 declaration. It legitimizes a political dynamic in which the moderates will be almost automatically disadvantaged. It's quite telling that Jokowi chose a Muslim cleric Maruf Amin, who had played a key role in the conviction and jailing of Ahok on a charge of blasphemy as his vice president candidate for this year's elections. In this regard, Indonesia's long-term trajectory is not particularly encouraging. What all this means, to put it all together, what all this means is that the idea of Indonesia is fundamentally incoherent and in all probability will remain incoherent for the foreseeable future. This has shackled the ambition unleashed by independence. Indonesia has not yet reached a stable post-Sohato equilibrium. 
Now, this does not mean that Indonesia has failed or will fail. It has performed quite credibly, but suboptimally. Certainly not up to its potential. This raises a question that is seldom articulated, but which is, I think, ever lurking in the subconsciousness of Indonesian nationalists. And that question is this. Why have we, a vast and richly endowed country, with a long and glorious history and a talented people, not done better? Indonesia's self-righteous sense of entitlement masks a deep inner insecurity. The insistence of its nationalism is as much a manifestation of insecurity as it is of confidence. An, answer, an honest answer to why Indonesia has not done as well as Indonesians deeply believe they deserve requires more self-awareness than an Indonesia ever hovering, to use a phrase coined by our former ambassador to Indonesia, the late Mr. Lee Kun Choi, an Indonesia ever hovering between myth and reality is prepared to admit. The easier answer is it must, it must be somebody else's fault. The British, the Americans, the Chinese, neo-colonialism, all established forces, stymieing new emerging forces, the formation of Malaysia, international financial markets, the IMF, and of course, Singapore. Now, will the separate but related dynamics that define Singapore's relations with Malaysia and Indonesia ever converge? How do we cope? How should we cope? with complexities that are as much psychological as material. On 9th August 1991, uh, our National Day, Malaysia and Indonesia staged a joint military exercise in Kota Tinggi in southern Johor, codenamed Pukol Habis. You know, total wipeout. <laughs> the declared reason for the exercise was to test a joint response in case a neighbouring country turned hostile and threatened either Indonesia or Malaysia. In response to the planned exercise, MINDEF conducted a large-scale open mobilisation on 8th August. Thousands of national servicemen were recalled. Live ammunition and new weapons were distributed. Armour and artillery moved to staging areas. Live mines were planted in key areas around Singapore. Troops armed with live ammunition were deployed around what was then the Malaysian railway station at Tanjung Paga. Our 26th National Day was celebrated as scheduled without incident. Now, the small number of Indonesian and Malaysian troops evolved, slightly over 300 paratroopers. It was an airborne exercise. Uh, indicated that they did not really plan an attack. But the timing and location was clearly intended to be provocative and a test of the resolve of a new Singapore leadership. Mr. Goh Chok Tong had replaced Mr. Lee Kuan Yew as Prime Minister in November the previous year. Indonesia and Malaysia have not held such provocative joint military exercises since then. And Indonesia's self-righteous nationalism is as much directed against Malaysia as against us. But the incident points to the possibility, to a, a possibility that requires constant alertness. Now, in 1991, the SAF had become a formidable force. In 1968, barely a year after the first batch of national servicemen had been called up, Mr. Lee Kuan Yew turned down a direct appeal from President Suharto to pardon two Indonesian Marines who had been sentenced to death for a terrorist attack at McDonald House in Orchard Road during Confrontasi. They were executed. A mob sacked our embassy in Jakarta and threatened to kill our ambassador. Incidentally, he was my father. <laughs> but on what grounds could we have pardoned the two Marines? The McDonald House bomb killed and injured civilian office workers. War had never been officially declared. Confrontasi was not conducted under the laws of war. The Marines were not in uniform. Their target could by no stretch of the imagination be considered military. The Marines in question were convicted of murder by a due process of law and executed after all legal appeals had been exhausted. To have pardoned them could have only 
been the small circumventing, subverting its own system to appease the big. Actually, there were four other Indonesians on death row for crimes committed during Konfrontasi who were not executed. Their attacks had killed no one, so they were not convicted of murder. Relations predictably took a downturn after the Marines were executed and remained frosty for several years. In 1973, Mr. Lee visited Indonesia and placed flowers on the graves of the two Marines, bringing the episode to a close and laying the groundwork for a long and fruitful relationship with Suharto and Indonesia. Now, nothing I have said this evening is intended to suggest that we cannot or should not cooperate with our neighbours. We can cooperate, we do cooperate, and we must cooperate with them. Mr. Lee Kuan Yew once told an Israeli general who, helped, who had helped start the SAF that we had learned two things from Israel. How to be strong and how not to use that strength. Meaning that strength is the foundation on which to build cooperation with our neighbours because there is no other choice but to live with them. The two anecdotes I have recounted are intended to illustrate some basic points about foreign policy and diplomacy I made somewhat abstractly or obliquely in my first lecture. The threat or use of force is as much part of diplomacy as negotiation. Diplomacy is not just about being nice. Cooperation must not compromise fundamental principles or values. Gracious gestures can be made only once fundamental principle is established. It is essential to credibly establish red lines because it is only when red lines are clearly understood by everyone that mutually beneficial relations can be conducted on the basis of mutual respect for each other's interests. Let me conclude with a quotation from a speech by Dr. Go King Sweet. He made the speech in 1970, but it is still very pertinent to the subject of this evening's lecture. It is a long quote, maybe too long with, to, which, to end a long lecture, but bear with me because it has a wider applicability than just our relations with Malaysia and Indonesia, and I will be referring to it in subsequent lectures. The speech is entitled, Facing the Future. Dr. Go said, and I quote, a more important source of difficulty stems from our economic role as a trading center of the region. Our businessmen in the ordinary course of work have numerous dealings with government officials of these countries. They have to obtain licenses, concessions, contracts and permits. Thus, the Singapore businessmen, in the eyes of these governments, uh, performs the role of supplicant for favours, as our businessmen often compete in their supplications, the image that this creates of Singapore can well be imagined. It is not unnatural, I suppose, for these governments to expect the Singapore government to behave in like manner. Dr. Go went on to say, and I quote again, businessmen have never hesitated to give me free advice on how to conduct foreign relations during the periodic roles we have had with our neighbours. Unfortunately, they do not understand, and I am afraid cannot understand, that in the nature of things, relations between independent sovereign states cannot be conducted on the basis of supplicant and overlord. The methods they found so successful in business are not available to us as a government.